usually in, in our communities, uh, we have, uh, you know, we're very tech, I'm sorry, there we go. Um, we're very tech focused, especially here in South Market and uh, in Silicon Valley. And we're always talking about the next big thing because we sort of get off on technology and it excites us. Um, and quite frankly, it gets a little old because the next big thing often turns out not to be the next big thing. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the big thing. It's not the next big thing. It has always been the big thing, and that's meaning. And we've heard that word uh, used already this, uh, this afternoon a couple times. Uh, and usually we don't stop and take the time to talk about what meaning is and how to use it or how to deconstruct it or what to do with it. We just know that inherently we feel that meaning is meaningful. Meaning is important. Meaning should be around, but we don't really know what to do with it and how to use it. Um, so this is an artifact that I uh, found on, on eBay of all places. It's a very simple piece of steel. It's bent in a very clever imaginative way. It has a certain function. Um, you can buy these for about 40 or $50 on eBay, surprisingly. What would lead someone to pay 40 or $50 for a bottle opener that happens to be just a, that's, a, that's its entire purpose, by the way, um, happens to be a simple bent piece of metal. Uh, when you could go buy a traditional bottle opener, I'm sure you've seen a, a ton of them for probably 50 cents or a dollar. Why is this worth 40 or $50? Well, the difference is that it has a connection has a meaningful connection to something, in this case the Concord, that it resonates for a lot of people. So the difference between uh, the dollar or dollar fifty or fifty cents that most people would pay for a, a bottle opener and this particular bottle opener is that meaning component. And that's because meaning transcends price and performance. And in the technology world, we, we almost exclusively focus on price and performance in our product development. Those are the two key ingredients that we look at when we develop new software, new hardware, all sorts of new experiences. And that is leaving out something obviously very financially valuable out of the equation because we simply don't know how to use it. Um, meaning lasts longer even than emotion. So uh, emotions are really important. They have a tremendous amount of resonance. We will often pay for things way beyond our budget or way beyond uh, the needs that we, the performance and feature needs that we think we have because they make us feel something. Maybe that's making us feel happy or younger or virile or sad or fearful if it's a scary movie. Um, but helping people feel something that's valuable to them has a resonance that's more important even than price and performance. It's much more powerful. But meaning transcends even this. Meaning transcends values. Um, uh, research I've done and I've seen from other places confirms that people are willing to pay for things uh, that are more expensive if they connect with their values. Um, and, and in fact, everyone wants to live and, and purchase things uh, not that that's the only component of living, uh, that, that resonate with their values. We want to be in line with our values and, and the things that we buy, the things that we use, the things that we experience, and we're willing to pay more um, as a result, uh, and, and very often a lot more as a result, if it's clear that they're connecting to our values. Meaning transcends even this. And it doesn't matter whether you want to wave the flag or burn the flag, whether you're liberal, whether you're conservative, whether you label yourself one way or the other, this is true for everybody. It is universal. We express these things differently, but, but at, at its heart, the core meanings that comprise sort of the meaning in our world are absolutely universal. They're universal for everyone. How we express them may be very different from each other. How we prioritize them may be very different, but they're always at work. And this is something that we should learn how to integrate into the things that we create for ourselves and the experiences that we create for other people. And I'm here to say that uh, the most successful experiences are the most meaningful, or the ones that resonate on this core level of meaning. And so if you accept this thesis, the next question you might ask is, OK, I'm down with this. How do I use this? What do I do about it? How do I put it into my development process? How do I talk about it, and how do I make it real for other people. And we can look at everything that we create, whether you're creating products or services, whether you're doing software, hardware, content, uh, events, experiences, etc. Everything we do creates experience and triggers or has a potential to trigger meaning whether we intend it or not, whether we're paying attention or not. And therefore, 
if we can create experiences for other people and we can trigger meaning for, meaning for other people, what experiences do we want? What, what experiences do we decide to create? So these are six dimensions of experience. I'm not going to go through them all. They're all important. But the most important one, or I should say the most powerful one, is the one in the upper, your upper left corner called significance. And it, it's part of every experience. Whether you pay attention to all these factors and all these elements or not, they are always active. And so when you decide to make something for other people, whether it's a, a wedding ceremony or a dinner party or a new piece of software or an, a, a tremendous new performance, these are all elements that you might choose to consider in order to make that experience better and in order to make it more meaningful. And so let me talk, let me zero in right on meaning. So meaning is a five-layered, um, it sort of looks like a hula hoop here, but it's a five-layered dimension uh, of significance, and it's the deepest, uh, most powerful layer of, this la of these layers of, of uh, significance. And so it starts out at price and performance, which are very rational. We think of them as very rational. They're usually explicit criteria that we put in our budgets or in our shopping list. You know, I need a new phone. It has to have these features, et cetera. The first questions we ask about when we want to create something are around, okay, does this do what I need it to do? This is a, or is it fast enough? Does it perform to my specifications? This is a very rational, uh, deliberate, and often explicit question I might ask myself in evaluating options, in, in evaluating choices. But this is the least significant, the least deep, or the shallowest uh, level of engagement I might have with an object, a product, or a person, or a service. The next level in is a question about value. So I might ask myself, okay, I've narrowed down my choices to the things that do what I need them to do. Which one am I willing to pay for? What price am I willing to put on pulling this new offering into my world? So this is a still rational uh, decision. It's still very much explicit. I might articulate this to someone. I might go to a salesman and say, you know, what's this one cost? Do you have something cheaper? Do you have discounts, etc." cetera? Uh, once we move to that next layer of emotions, things start getting really different. Um, emotions are incredibly powerful. And, uh, they're obviously incredibly wonderful. That's why they're so powerful. But, but something happens in that we, we very often don't articulate our emotions, so they become subconscious dec deciders in our processes. We might articulate price and performance, but we don't run around to people and say, which one's going to make me happier? Uh, we might say, like, does this make me fat, or does this make me look cool, but we don't usually say, you know, like, does this make me ten years, look ten years younger? That's something we sort of say for ourselves, but it's still an incredibly rational decision um, making process. We usually call these sort of irrational decisions or irrational elements, but they're entirely rational. You can deconstruct them and they make a great deal of sense. It's just that they're often hidden and we're not usually trained on how to deal with them very well. And we're only halfway through this dimension. The next layer in is all about values. And this is where things get really tricky because people express and prioritize their meanings, their core meanings, in very different ways, which essentially creates and expresses our values, and they can be often at odds with other people's values, even though they relate to the same core meaning. And so that's this fifth layer, this deepest layer, where we don't ask, does this do what I want it to do, or what I need to do? We don't ask, you know, is it worth it to me to buy this one versus another? And we're not even asking, you know, how does this make me feel, or is this me? Does this fit my values? In this case, we ask, does this fit my reality? And so what we found is that there's 15 core meanings. These are universal around the world. doesn't matter where you grew up, which media, which television show, or if you didn't have television at all. Every single person in the world understands these 15 core meanings. And that's really great for us who create programs or products or services, et cetera, because it gives us a place to start that's uh, a point that's common between us and our teams, us and our organization, us and our customers, no matter who those customers are. The trick here is that different groups of people and individuals, they prioritize these differently and they express them differently. And that's what makes it really interesting to develop things for other people, especially if you want to develop something that's a meaningful experience. Because now you have to pay attention to the priorities and the expressions of their core meanings 
in order to understand how to trigger those things in order to, to bring meaning into their lives. Now, I use the word trigger very carefully because we're not creating meaning for other people. We're creating meaningful experiences. We're triggering meaning for them within their own meaning systems, within their own values, within their own expressions. There's a big difference there. Usually as designers and developers, we're used to creating things. Here we're, we're consciously saying we're not creating meaning, we are ex it, we're uh, triggering it. We're trying to trigger expressions of it. And then this gets put right into, in, in our case, this is, this is part of how we teach our students in our MBA program, in our executive programs. This is the core of how we teach them to, to create offerings, to create services, to serve the, the customers they have or the world at large. So when you can put meaning at the core of values and priorities, you know how people will respond better to what you're creating because you know how they're expressing things. I'll give you a quick e example. Um, everyone understands the concept of freedom. As a core meaning, freedom is pretty much a universal. We know why freedom would be important, but we don't all prioritize it the same way. To me, living in San Francisco, in California, in the United States, it's not one of my top priorities because it doesn't have to be. I sort of get it for free. It's part of the standard operating experience here. Um, so it's not something I focus on. But if I lived in a part of the world or I traveled to a part of the world where it was an issue, it would be a natural priority. Would, so already the, the, the fact that I have a different priority on freedom starts to set up a difference that I need to be aware of if I'm going to design for someone that has that, um, that priority. My expression of freedom can be very different than other people's expression. Here in the US, we tend to think of freedom as a mechanism where if we can't do whatever the hell we want, whenever we want, we're not free, right? In Europe, to use one example, they have a very different expression of freedom. A, they may prioritize it more or less, but they express freedom sort of through regulation. We will all agree and collaborate uh, to conform to regulations so that we can all be free from each other, you know, from bothering each other. So it, I have a friend whose friend lives in an uh, apartment complex, a condo in uh, Geneva, and he can only do his laundry at one, one time period per week. He's not allowed to do his laundry any other time. If he misses that, he's out of luck. He cannot flush his toilet after 10 p.m. because doing so might bother someone else, right? So there's a concept of and an expression of freedom that's very different than what we would experience in the United, in, in the United States. For instance, here we would look at that and say, you are not free if, you, if someone's controlling when you can and cannot flush your toilet. In fact, I'm going to get up at 3 o'clock this morning and flush my toilet just to make sure that I'm free, right? So we have different expressions of this. But they're expressing, the same, they're expressing the same core meaning. And so that core meaning is a point where we can have a shared conversation and from there co-develop more meaningful experiences. We just have to be aware of these things. And it's actually really easy. This goes right into your development process. The strategic end and the product development or service development end, it's easy or it's, uh, it's simple, it's clear to do this research up front to find these priorities and expressions and then code for those triggers later in development. Just part of the, the same kinds of uh, things that you look at in your design or customer research anyway. It's just a matter of having to do this. So who's doing this? Well, you're doing this. You just don't realize it most of the time. We create already meaningful experiences for other people. We've always done it. It's usually culture or religious institutions or other societal in institutions that have done it. But we've mostly done it accidentally or unintentionally. And that's fine. We've managed to eke out a fair amount of meaning in our lives. I think we can do a lot better though. And having an understanding of these models and knowing how to put it into our development processes mean that we can do it deliberately. I mean, if it's this powerful, why wouldn't you want to do it deliberately? Why would you choose to continue to do it accidentally? Now this brings up some, some interesting questions. The first of which is, should we be doing this? How do you feel about organizations doing this? And I have students, especially, it's funny, the students in, in Europe react to this in a very different way than my students in the United States. Here, they're like, right on, okay, I'm going to do this now. And in Europe, they're a lot more um, conservative in the sense that they look at this and, and think, 
I'm not sure I'm comfortable with Nike and P&G and McDonald's and Coca-Cola or Nestle doing this. They see this often as a, a more sophisticated form of propaganda, a manipulation. It's a, it's a good question. It may, be a, it may be entirely possible that we can manipulate people more sensitively using these tools. Um, my attitude is we're doing it already. We, again, we do it intuitively, we do it accidentally. If we at least do it deliberately, we're increasing our chances of doing it for the right reasons. And why would it be a problem to create more meaningful experiences for people in the stuff that we create anyway? If we're gonna go through the, bottom, the bother and the energy to make it, we might as well make it more meaningful and let people decide whether it's truly triggering the meanings that they wanna be associated with or they wanna fill their lives with or not. So a question that I hope you start asking yourself is, what are you doing to create meaning in the lives of the people that you serve? Whether you call them customers or users or audiences or participants or family members or friends um, or um, children. Because these are tools available for you to answer this question. The first thing you would want to do though is ask yourself, what meanings do they care, care about? What do they prioritize and how do they express them? The second question you want to answer or ask is, what are the meanings that your organization, your company, your client, what is it that they want to prioritize and express? This is really important in order to find the overlap because otherwise you have the wrong people serving the wrong people or the right people serving the wrong people or vice versa. And ne next you have to do, uh, you have to ask a very personal question. You have to ask yourself, what's important to you? What meanings do you express and do you prioritize? Because if there's not overlap between these three areas, you may be working for the wrong organization. You may be serving the wrong people. And if that's the case, there's a good, <laughs> a good uh, possibility that you're in the wrong job or you're focusing your energies in the wrong place, in places that aren't meaningful to you. And, and that's just a waste of your time. It's a waste of whatever the energy and uh, materials used in the things you end up creating. Lastly, and this is a more uh, business associated question, is what are the meanings being expressed and prioritized by your competitors? Because if you can eke out a focus that is at this overlap and outside what your competitors are doing, to use a real um, you know, sort of business market process, then you have a real shot at creating something not only meaningful but differentiable. Um, on, on some level, we're always competing, whether you want to use a market definition or a business context or not, because at least, at the very least, we're all competing for attention. Um, so if you want to be successful at creating meaningful experiences, you can use these models and these processes to hone in and, and essentially make your work, make your energy, make your creativity count more. If you want to learn more about this, you can find the definitions for these core meanings. There's stories that help illuminate it, um, but I'll just leave you with the, uh, the question, what is meaningful to you and what are you doing to create meaning for others? Thank you.